Hey everyone, my name is Eric Bonn and I'm one of the co-founders at Hustle Fund, joined with my co-founder Elizabeth Yin. And welcome to today's session. It's called How to Fundraise in Silicon Valley. So, uh, you know, this is a unique event that we've tried to design specifically for Canadian founders who are trying to go through the process of raising remote. And just a caveat, we are uh, seed stage investors. So keep in mind that the context of what we share today will be oriented to, to, to those who are sort of in the earliest parts of your journeys in going through the fundraise process. So I know you're right now probably sitting at a Tim Hortons trying to recover from a long evening of drinking Labatt Blue and Crown Royale whiskey uh, while watching hockey, thinking about you know, your next big fundraise ahead. Um, but the good news is that you know, our team supports lots and lots of Canadian founders. I actually grew up next to Canada myself and traveled there quite a bit as a kid. And we've seen many successful processes where great founders like yourself are able to raise from investors all over the world, especially Silicon Valley, where Elizabeth and I are sitting to get today. So today's session is actually quite a bit of material. We, we put together a comprehensive workshop. Uh, it's kind of like three presentations in one, uh, but more on that in a second. Let me, let me go ahead and actually share what the agenda is going to look like for today. So there's really three parts to this presentation. We're gonna focus on assets, uh, things that you, like artifacts that you need to create like a pitch deck and so forth, um, as well as uh, how you run the process. And then finally the closing process. Now there might be some, you know, very annoying dad jokes and Canadian dad jokes along the way. So please be forgiving. Elizabeth had no input on them. It's all me if you need to at me on Twitter. Okay, so we're gonna keep it kind of brief, you know, in terms of the stuff that we put together. We'll have about 30 minutes of uh, presentation content that we are going to, uh, to walk through all of those three areas. And then there's gonna be a moderated Q&A at the end. Uh, so I'm gonna drive most of the presentation part of it, the first half, and then Elizabeth, my colleague, will help with managing the questions that arise at the end. And we're gonna try to keep it to about uh, 25 minutes or so of, of uh, prepared uh, content. So uh, hope you're excited and ready to take some notes. And if you're not taking notes, you're just sitting back again, still sipping on other kinds of Canadian coffees from Tim Horton, the lattes, the maple syrup lattes, uh, then this is gonna get, this is gonna get into a lot of trouble today, by the way, Liz. <laughs> uh, then, you know, no worries. We actually are gonna record this entire session as well. Okay, so uh, first a little bit about ourselves. So me and Elizabeth were, Friends of 21 years, co-founders at Hustle Fund, uh, have raised a lot of money internationally as well. Uh, we're based in the United States, but we raised in Asia and Canada, elsewhere. So we have distilled a lot of this kind of uh, knowledge and expertise, I think, over the years of lots and lots of failure and a little bit of success, right? So that's, that's kind of where we're triangulating into today's session. Um, you know, before we jump right into the content, though, uh, we want to call out the fact that today's session is only possible because we have an incredible partner. Uh, we're working with Silicon Valley Bank Canada. This team has been super supportive and really creative in collaborating with us to put together today's session. So I want to share a little bit about uh, what Silicon Valley Bank Canada is up to now. Uh, so Silicon Valley Bank understands uh, the questions of what's next, what if, now what? Um, they understand that these questions actually keep founders up at night. And more than 35 years ago, Silicon Valley Bank was born into the heart of the innovation economy. They believed in and worked with some of the world's greatest innovators and their investors, helping them move their bold ideas forward fast. In 2019, they opened an office in Toronto dedicated to lending to Canadian businesses and their investors. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank's unique financial solutions, insights, and connections have been helping Canadian technology and life sciences businesses and their investors to succeed. Get in touch today at svb.com slash Canada. We're so grateful to Silicon Valley Bank Canada. The team has been awesome again. And many of our founders, especially those who are based in Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, uh, they're happy clients of Silicon Valley Bank Canada as well. So please check out svb.com slash Canada. All right. So I think uh, we're ready to do this. Elizabeth, are you ready? You're muted probably. Yeah, right? let's do it. Um, hopefully we'll be let across the border again when it opens, but uh, yes. let's go. Yes, this might be the day that actually the Trudeau administration bans us or the Ford mission, whatever. All of them are going to ban us. Let's find out. Okay, so let's talk about the assets that you need to prepare 
for your fundraise. So we're going to go through, uh, I think, five key areas. Uh, and I think the first four in particular are the most important, especially at the seed stage. Data room, eh, maybe. We're not going to cover that too much, especially at the seed stage. It becomes a little bit more relevant a little bit later on. We'll cover that so uh, a little bit later. Okay, so let's, let's do this in order. You know, for us, we think that one of the best places to begin in uh, preparing for your fundraise is actually comes down to a very simple list. It could be done on Airtable, it could be done on Google Sheets, but is your list of your investors that you want to target. So, uh, you know, a lot of people go to some of the more common tools like AngelList, NFX Signal, even LinkedIn to try to compile a list of angels as well as VCs after you've done your research, figuring out like those whom you think might be a fit. fit. But there are also some very uh, surprising sources you may want to think about. So every year or every few years, Elizabeth uh, gets her eyes checked uh, because she has terrible vision. And then uh, she'll then like talk about hustle fund to her optometrist who happens to be an accredited investor, optometrist, dentist, doctors, they tend to be fairly wealthy and then pitches her autom optometrist on hustle fund and trying to make the case that he or she should invest. And the optometrist, by the way, always says no. So, so uh, but like she keeps trying, right? So when you think about your investor list, I think a lot of founders start off um, thinking real too narrowly, you know, thinking like, you know, well, I want someone that actually has a track record in uh, working with uh, technology companies or someone who's already like a, um, a venture capitalist, but that's, that's fine. And you should have a certainly a, a heavy pool of that stuff. But thinking a little bit more creatively of that anyone who is an accredited investor a member uh, that you, a friend at church, like a, a, a number of someone that's in the professions that you know, is a viable person to potentially invest in your company, so long as they are credited. Now, in Canadian terms, I think this is going to be a little bit confusing because I'm not quite sure what Canadian laws are when it comes to accredited investors. But if you're trying to get angels from the United States, friends down here, it's a really simple definition. Anyone who has a million dollars of liquid net worth is considered accredited or is earning $200,000 a year in salary as an individual or as a couple is earning $300,000 a year in salary. That is the definition of accredited investor if you fit one of those three categories in the United States. Okay, so uh, I highly encourage you to, to think about expanding your list into those folks. And the key is this, you wanna have um, the name of that person, name of their fund, and then identify the person who can make that warm referral. And that can usually be triangulated by looking at LinkedIn, seeing who all the secondary connections are so that uh, they can pass along your blurb and make, put in a nice word for you. And then a little bit of light CRMing is good, right? Like when did you start the conversation? Did they reject you? What kind of feedback and so forth? So it's a really good place to begin is this. And by the way, I usually do not do this investor list on my own as a founder. I like to collaborate with other founders, other friends that I trust, where we can gather their inputs as a, as a sort of like a village, right, together. So think about that when it comes to uh, the construction of your Airtable uh, investor list. The next thing is asset that's really critical is actually your forwardable blurb. <clears throat> so I think in this, uh, I'm going to kind of move a little bit brief, uh, swiftly through this. So this is, I think, the most important asset, actually. Uh, the goal of this is after you've come up with your list of 100 investors or so, or even more that you want to target, and you've identified all the secondary connections like Elizabeth who can forward your blurb along or, or, or offer an intro, you want to supply the blurb so that you make Elizabeth's life as easy as possible to say like, hey, Bill Gates, like, you know, are you interested in, in meeting my friend Eric? Here's some context below. So let's talk about the anatomy of a really good forwardable blurb. Um, the first goal is you don't want your referrer to do any work. It's just like two seconds to pass this along, right? So if you provide the blurb and maybe even supply a little bit of copy for each refer person that you want referred to, uh, that's, that's always nice. Um, and then the second thing is this goal, which is the, go the goal is not to have the person who receives the blurb to say like, I'm ready to invest. That's, that's just not practical and it's not going to happen. It's more about their responding saying, I am interested in speaking to this person. So please connect, that's it, right? And then Elizabeth can add you on, on the CC and then she's gone. So um, so let's take a look at this, uh, this blurb um, that has like the salutation. Do you mind sending this along to Jane? Uh, I like to start with a very, very quick 
sentence or two on what your company does. Include just two or three really interesting bullets about what your what your um, business traction has been or the sexiest details about your company. It's not meant to be comprehensive. You're, you're trying to produce just, I think, initial interest. Uh, I think that including something around your team is normally really good, as well as your blurb. And then finally, is a call to action, call to action, or I guess more information, which could be in the form of a teaser deck, uh, as well as your contact information. And that's it. It doesn't have to be much longer than what I shared here. In fact, it could be even shorter and still quite effective. So uh, this is a good one to screenshot if, if you're looking to construct your own blurb. We actually have tons of information about constructing forward blurbs at the Hustle Fund YouTube channel as well. <clears throat> okay, we're kind of going out of order here because I, I generally think that the teaser deck should be created after you created your, your full deck. But the teaser deck is really simple. It's, it's not, again, a comprehensive asset here. It's actually meant to be a five slide or six slide deck that includes, that covers like the basics of your team, problem solution, market interaction. Why is your team compelling and qualified to solve the, the given problem? What is the problem statement? How did you arrive at this problem statement? What kind of customer discovery did you do? The solution is generally your product or service that you're trying to sell. Um, a description of the market and the opportunity. Is it large? That's pretty much the only answer that you see at the the, the only question that needs to be answered. And then finally, if you have traction, which at the earlier stages is a little bit more forgiving, but early pilots or early users of your product, that's always nice to put into uh, a nice teaser deck. We recommend dropping this thing behind a doc send. Now there's other services out there like pitch.com and, and others, whatever is fine, but have some sort of static URL link where you can always update the content on the back end as you're you know, evolving the materials is very, very important. And it has great stocking tools. So if, you're, if Elizabeth is trying to play radio silence on your, on your pitch and you're looking at your deck, um, but you notice that she's logging in like 10 times a day, that's a little bit of a tell that there could be some interest there. And perhaps she's playing a little bit of game. By the way, she, Elizabeth is not one to play games when it comes to uh, working with founders. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, and of course, like a, a good teaser deck in any slide actually should always have your contact information. I feel like this is lost because I can't tell you the number of times that random VCs have sent me like a screen cap of a slide or something uh, to, to make a point or something. And it would have been nice to know like who these, who these founders are. So assume that these materials get widely shared even uh, beyond your control. And we can sort of talk about that in Q&A if there's interest about that. And finally, um, your full deck. Right, so, well, there's one more thing after this, but the full deck, uh, this is the, the big pitch. So after you've set up the meeting and you're now in the, the conversation with the, with the, the VC, <clears throat> um, you know, I, I personally don't like to use any deck when I pitch, but we'll talk about that in the next section or two. But, uh, you know, this is, this is the full context material here that you'll hopefully have a, the, um, your ability to, to voice narrate, to, to provide that, that nice full context. So personas actually really matter. So if you've ever, ever worked in product management, this is a, a concept that you've probably heard, which is, uh, uh, you know, let's identify like a stereotype or like a trope of the, of the ideal person whom the product uh, would be buying or using the product. In this case, like let's define the persona of the, the, the VC. It's overwhelmingly skewed towards men, uh, overwhelmingly skewed towards privileged men who went to good schools, worked at fancy places like McKinsey and so forth. Maybe they like to wear vests and Albert shoes or Adam shoes at this point. And, you know, I've tried ayahuasca in Tulum, you know, when, when COVID is done this year, like go to Burning Man next year. Think about that kind of persona, uh, a little bit broy, but, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of, uh, it's helpful to at least have that kind of litmus test when you think about how you're designing the materials. Good news is this, by the way, uh, the asset allocators, those who are VCs as angels is rapidly diversifying. So this trope feels less and less true every day. So wide array of very interesting people to pitch to. And uh, we have a full video actually about constructing your pitch deck that I highly recommend that you check out on, at, when we search for Hustle Fund on YouTube. But the idea is this, if you could take away one thing about your pitch deck, make each of the slide titles a sentence such that as you read just the titles, it forms a complete paragraph that communicates 70% of what your, your entire company is all about. So that you don't, don't even have to read the content of the slides. <clears throat> we actually go into this quite a bit into that um, previous recording that, that I shared, but that schemable slide headlines thing, I think is a key point here. All right. And then the data room essentials, you know, uh, really, really rarely do we find seed companies that put together all this stuff. 
but it's it's good to have your your house in order because uh, you know some seed investors do ask for these things and definitely Series A and beyond. Uh, the the questions around you know how are you set up, you know uh, are your options all buttoned up and so forth become really important. So I'm not going to go into these details. Uh, for most of this, those who are just raising on safes at the earliest formation, you might only have articles in incorporation, and that's pretty much it. Maybe some PIIA stuff here, um, and uh, that's pretty much the extent of it for for many of like the earlier companies that we see. Okay. So I know we breezed through that, but we have uh, two other areas. And the goal for today's session, again, was to provide kind of like a more comprehensive view of what the preparation and the process looks like for raising your capital abroad. And we will have time at, uh, in the last 30 minutes or so of today's sessions to go through QA and dive through each of these things. So let's talk about running the fundraise process. This is actually one of my favorite topics because I think there's something new things that many of you guys are actually going to learn uh, because there's a little bit of counter narrative in terms of how we think about the fundraise process itself. Okay, the goal is this. There's you right in the middle and then there's an auction that's happening where tons of VCs and angels are just fighting to get their way in. All right, that's always the best kind of situations to be in because you are in control of whom you select can come into the round, how much they get, as well as the terms. Right. If you uh, an auction is defined as at least two parties who are trying to compete to get into the deal. If it's just one party, then that is not an auction. And you tend to find that there are some suboptimal qualities to term sheets you might be looking at, or at least uh, uh, whom you can select if there's not really any other choices out there. So FOMO is what it's all about, and we want to talk about a process that we think is effective in keeping your timeline short for when you fundraise but uh, driving towards, I think, uh, the right kind of timing so that multiple people are coming in to drive that auction. So let's talk about this. Um, I like to think of things as a, a Fortnite, you know, not the game. I've never played it myself. I'm a little too old now. But actually, a Fortnite, the, the old, like, British erstwhile definition of, like, you know, we're all in the Commonwealth here, I guess, in Canada, of, like, two weeks, right? So we think that for a lot of seed fundraisers and a lot of maybe even Series A and Beyond fundraisers, the first meeting cadence can all be accomplished within two weeks. So let me introduce you to the fortnight of hell uh, that you may be experiencing in this process. Okay, I cheated because it's not quite two weeks. It's actually like two and a half weeks. So let's talk about Thursday. This is like, you know, T minus three days or something before this all begins. So at this point, you have all the assets created. You have this wonderful air table or Google sheet or whatever it is that has all of your investor targets, all the people who have committed to making that introduction, you know, all that is nicely buttoned up. And not only that, you've been able to stack rake your investors from like, like top tier number one, Eric Bond to like tier five, which is like Elizabeth, right? So like, you know, everyone is ranked uh, in, in order of priority. <clears throat> Usually it's the other way around, by the way. So, uh, and then uh, this is what you're going to do. You're going to tell everyone who is committed to giving you a warm referral, uh, wh whom you've passed the blurbs on to, to drop their introduction all at the same time. It's gonna be on Thursday night. And then what happens is a bunch of people are gonna opt in the next day or two and say like, yeah, okay, I'm Eric, you know, I'm a tier five investor. I'm interested in meeting you know, founder Elizabeth. All these opt-ins come in, hopefully from the 100 introductions, something like you know, 50, 70 say like, yeah, I'm interested in meeting this person, this founder. You ghost. You don't say a freaking word, right? Like you, you get all the opt-ins, they're sitting in your inbox, you are not scheduling anyone yet. Why is this important? Okay, so now this is where the fortnight truly begins. So I'd actually continue ghosting them through Saturday, personally, but some of, some of us don't have the intestinal fortitude to do that anymore. So the idea is this, you want to be able to see who is opting in so that you are in control of your schedule to make sure that you're prioritizing the right to your investors. So what happens is this, on week one, Monday through Wednesday, you're gonna prioritize your tier two investors, okay? So these are the people who are like really nice to have and you'd be delighted to work with them, but they're not quite your number one like Elizabeth, right? <clears throat> so um, you, you wanna get your reps in, you know, like get the pitch in, like, you know, you're, you're scheduling five to 10 meetings a day, so hopefully, after your 15th or 20th or 25th 
meeting, you're going to be in really good shape because you've, you've been able to hear a lot of the feedback and ingest that and even maybe uh, permutate your presentation a little bit for your first meetings. Wednesday through Friday, you elevate from tier two to tier one. These are your dream investors, Elizabeth, Sheehan, not Eric Bond. And like, uh, these are all my house fund colleagues, by the way. And so, you know, your best pitch is now ready. You know, you've put in your practice and you're get, letting these tier one investors get exposed to your deal early into the process. That weekend, you're not doing anything, okay? Now, um, if, you're, if you're so inclined, you could do this all through Zoom. Uh, maybe you need to just keep your bandwidth free in, in case someone wants to do Zoom coffee with you. If you do decide to do these in person, this advice works in person as well as <clears throat> um, through, through online platforms as well, then uh, you know, keep your weekend clear. You're, you're in the Bay Area. You're not, you're not gonna you know, go to Great America Park or something like in, in Silicon Valley with your family. Like your, your family, forget them, right? Just like people are gonna wanna take you to breakfast, uh, go on walks at the park, you know, walk their dog, go to dinner, to have drinks. You need to prepare for that. And a lot of the courting tends to happen after that first weekend. Week two, Monday through Tuesday, any remaining tier one and tier two investors that want to speak, try to slot them in as early as possible. And then Wednesday through Friday is when you go through all of the long tail garbage, right? So all the like people that are just like, whatever, right? I need them as stalking horses. I, like maybe they're fine. Eric seems okay. But like, I really want him to just like drop a term sheet so he can serve as the stocking horse in this auction, right? And hopefully on the Friday of that second week, multiple term sheets are dropping at once. And you gave pole position to your tier one and two tier, tier two investors from the previous week to give them, give them enough time to get, get that FOMO going. Now, it doesn't end at the end of two weeks, to be honest with you, All right? These are your first meetings. So likely you're gonna need to do some more follow-ups and it could take two, three, four weeks, especially if it's a larger uh, round. If this is just your first million dollars, a million and a half, all through space, <clears throat> it's possible that <clears throat> there isn't that much due diligence or that's required subsequent to that first meeting. And, and maybe you can grab some angels pretty quickly to get momentum, which is a cool position to be in. Um, by the second second week is like, yeah, like half the round's already filled with cool angels. So this is what the Fortnite looks like. Uh, and I think the idea is just like, you know, you want to get back to work as quickly as possible and drive as much FOMO as possible. And that's a really good mechanism to do it. And again, the goal is to put yourself in the middle of an auction, your team, all right? And this is like some of the, 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 the best ways that we know of, of driving that kind of a process. Okay, so we have covered assets, we have covered process, and now finally we're going to cover mechanics uh, by, uh, and this is the last part of our trifecta presentation before we open it up to Q&A to hopefully give you a sense and where you can walk away with a comprehensive view of what your fundraise process is going to look like sitting in Toronto. I'm running out of like Canadian jokes, like my, my references, the, the only last thing I can think of is like, after you sort of walk, walk out of your Toronto Phantom of the Opera matinee, I don't know if you guys know this, but the Phantom of the Opera has been running for like 40 years in Toronto and in Michigan, where I grew up, we were incessantly advertised to go see the Phantom of the Opera, which I saw six times as a kid. I need to still talk to my therapist about that because I'm, I'm clearly still very triggered by it. Let's talk about how to fundraise and close on Zoom. Okay, so... What's the current state of VC fundraising? Look, I'm double vaccinated. Elizabeth is too. <clears throat> That's a little bit of a like an unfair flex because I understand that you know Canadians right now are a little bit slower to get vaccinated as of May 26, 2021 in this recording. It seems like life is getting back to normal, but the reality is I think that Zoom pitching is here to stay. We have had a wonderful one year of conditioning where VCs at writ large in terms of our industry are generally pretty cool with uh, at least first pitches being done on Zoom. And that wasn't true before COVID at all, right? But now I think it is true. So stick to Zoom for your first meetings in particular because you can slot in a lot of people at once, all right? So we're gonna talk about the mechanics of an awesome pitch. And, and, and as part of this, I wish I cleaned my garage a little bit better. It's gonna be a garage tour, okay? so. Um, as Elizabeth can attest, you know, we've raised about $50 million across our two funds. The vast majority of the money, whether it's from like people here in the United States or, or around the world has been done in this exact setup. 
me in my garage, Elizabeth with her psychotic hippo background on Zoom, okay? Despite all those things, like we've been able to make it work. So I'm confident that you can make it work as well. All right, let's begin with the tour. So I'm gonna pick up the camera and now you can see some of my setup here. Uh, so I got this nice big monitor, light, camera, uh, which I'm holding, and then uh, my sound system. And it's me actually sitting uh, on a, or standing actually on a treadmill. So that's that's how I work, okay? Uh, I stopped treadmilling, by the way, during founder pitches, because I was like, this is so awkward, uh, but I do treadmill eight miles a day, almost. Okay, so the idea is this, which is, uh, let me actually put this back for a second and come back to, to the tour. Eye contact is actually looking at the camera lens. Okay, it looks a little, it feels a little bit awkward when you're doing it, but uh, when you're actually doing it, <laughs> like for the recipient, it actually, it does look pretty natural, I think. So the trick is this, you want to have the camera position about an inch higher than uh, your eye level because, you know, you don't, you don't want to get like the you know, double chin effect there, right? You want that, that tight, tight chin right there. So looking up slightly is, is usually the more, um, beautiful angle, I guess. Uh, uh, in addition to that, um, you know, some people using backgrounds is totally fine. For me, actually, I, I don't like to hide the fact that I work in my garage. It's actually become a bit of a shtick because it actually invites very interesting ways to kick off a meeting, right? When, when like rich person Elizabeth who runs Sovereign Wealth Fund of, <clears throat> of Korea or whatever, like is, is talking to me, She's like, wait a second, are you actually in your garage? I'm like, yeah, this is not a Zoom background. You can tell tons of jokes. Like, here are my garage, my garbage cans. Like, this is, here actually is my truck collection. You know, it's not mine. There's a hammock right here where my son likes to take naps, right? It's, it, it's kind of fun to have a voyeuristic view of the world. Uh, we're using uh, both of us like a Logitech C920 1080p camera. It's, it's not very expensive. I think it's like $30 on Amazon. So that's cool. Uh, what you're going to notice actually too is like in my setup, I have a, you know, a video of myself and Elizabeth uh, running towards the top. I have my notes towards the top and then the slides. I try to keep everything high up so that if I need to refer to things and re read something, it still feels kind of natural. So putting things way above the fold, I think is really critical. Now, the most important equipment is the sound. Okay, like that's that's where you put all of your money. I'm using an Audio Technica AT2020 USB microphone. I just bought one for my wife yesterday. It's 150 bucks. Of all the equipment to buy, this is the one because video is relatively forgivable if it's a bit janky. You know, if it's just your Apple computer, no one really cares for the most part. But good audio is critical. Okay. So invest in that. I think one underlying thing that has been mentioned that I didn't include in the slide is having great internet too. Um, it's worth it to spend for the gigabit connection. If it's there, at least in the Bay Area, it's $80 or $70 a month now, I think. So um, expensive, but not like unreasonably so. And reliable internet, I think under underwrites this entire process. And finally, there's the lighting. So I bought like this, this light for like $10. It came directly from China. I couldn't even read the label in a plastic bag, but it does the trick. You know, you don't need to overinvest in like a ring light or anything like that. I do think having a giant clock too, uh, which, I, and I literally just Amazon like giant clock uh, and I got the most giant clock possible. That's important to have too. And having it, I think above, above your view is good because sometimes when you're in full presentation mode, you actually can't see how long things are going. So keeping track of the time is important. And I realized that I'm actually starting to run a little bit over. So I want to get to the Q&A. But that's what our, our setup looks like. It's really, really chill. And I think you can do this for under 200 bucks to get top grade equipment. OK. So uh, just a few more things here. We never pitch with a deck, ever. Why? The, the, so we use our, our full deck as, as more of like a follow-up asset, which is you know after the presentation is done, we immediately send a deck, our data room, like any kind of relevant materials as a reference. But we like to pitch because we enjoy seeing people's faces as we speak. And people generally have terrible poker faces, except for Elizabeth, who likes to study poker and is just inscrutable, just generally. So, um, you know, when you start to see people like nodding, that's usually a sign of like, maybe I should like really hammer in on this detail. Like this is, this seems to be an area that's really touching. Or if they're starting to look bored or like falling asleep, 
Can you snap them out of it? Tell a joke, right? Like tell a side story. Uh, those kinds of things are really important. In addition to that too, I like to stare at myself. And it's not because I'm just, you know, a raging narcissist that's that's like going through therapy to try to work on that. That's partly true. But but the the reality too is also it's a good reminder to see what you look like. And you got to smile more, right? So this is actually something Elizabeth said. It's like, uh, you know, especially like in situations where it's like really awkward or like someone's giving, like you're trying to deliver like bad feedback, just smile more and more. And, and people can, it's harder for people to like not be, uh, angry at you, I guess, or, or something like that. But like, the idea is this, we, like in, in film and te television, which I've never studied, like 10% more is always good. Like smile like 10% more than you normally would in real life. Like right now, I'm, I'm smiling like, I don't, I never smile this much. Like, you know, but, but it looks kind of natural, right? And then uh, also when it comes to voice and, and gesticulation, modulation, you know, 10% more, 10% less, you know, that kind of stuff comes off actually looking much more natural than you think in a pitch, right? And people love to see great passionate people who are, you know, arms wide open, like power posing, all that jazz, right? So no deck so that you have the ability to permutate your message as needed on the fly in the pitch, uh, being able to see people's reactions to make those pivots along the way in your story. And um, I actually do think that always having some back pocket interesting side stories is important if in case you need to snap people back into attention or just drive really hard on a certain, a certain point. Okay, so, uh, and then uh, the, some of the other mechanics here is just, uh, you know, you want you to be in control of your fundraise process. So ending your sessions to try to understand like, like what does the next steps look like? How do you make your decisions? Can we look at our calendars right now? to book the book time within the next two days, or if there's no time for that in your follow-up emails, committing to actually following up within two days, uh, saying like, I am going to follow up with you in two days to talk about next steps and so forth. You gotta be in control. Don't let the VC say, I'll let you know. They might ghost you. They may not feel any urgency. They may actually just be waiting for momentum. And this is actually what our follow-up email looks like. So I tried to send this within one meeting, one minute after we turn off our cameras and end the Zoom call. I have this set up as a template. And it's like, very simple. It's just, thanks for your time. Here's some materials. I'm going to follow up soon, All right? That's about it, All right? This is actually my real template. And even then, even this one, I'm being a bit hypocritical. I'm not quite following my advice. It's like I'm going to follow up within two days. I don't really quite do that as much anymore. Okay, so we've gone through quite a journey just now over the past 30 minutes or so, right? We talked about the assets. We talked about the fundraising process. And we finally talked about some of the mechanics of delivering your pitch on Zoom effectively. So if you need more advice from us, we put on these sessions, usually monthly, uh, but we also have a huge repository of past recordings on all aspects of the fundraising process, uh, as well as the, the seed startup phase, which you can check out by searching for Hustle Fund on YouTube. So let's pause here to see whether you have any questions. And uh, yes, we're going to invite back our friend Hong Pham. He is our creative director at Hustle Fund, very kindly offering to serve as producer for today's event. If you have questions, please pump them into the Q&A box of this Zoom webinar. And uh, we're going to try to get through as many of these possible. And Elizabeth, I'm going to turn it to you to take the lead on the Q&A. Great, thanks, Eric. Yeah, let's do it. Bring your questions. Okay, so first question from Joel. Uh, Joel asks, I have been led to believe that U.S. angels have certain tax breaks if they invest in a U.S. startup that are not possible if they invest in a non-U.S. company. Is this correct? Uh, yes, that can be true. So there's something called QSBS here in the U.S. And without going into details, basically it was a way to incentivize U.S. investors to invest in uh, small businesses here in the US. And if things go well in the long term, then actually uh, US investors don't pay any taxes on their gains at all, which is phenomenal. That being said, I would say that is not a deal breaker for getting an investment as a Canadian entity from US investors. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons why people invest. Tax breaks are certainly one of them, but hopefully not the end all be all. There are many ways to get tax breaks. And so, you know, I would just focus on making this a great opportunity. And we're seeing more and more U.S. investors invest in Canadian entities. And I think in particular, one reason is that Canadian entities, as you all know, have a lot of benefits in, quote, staying Canadian. 
uh, as far as you know, the shred credits and all of that, you certainly don't get that as a U.S. Corp uh, corporation. So, you know, even if the U.S. investors are not getting tax breaks themselves, their companies are able to to take their money further. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, next question is from George. When you are not phys physically located in the valley, your network kind of takes a dent. What are the best channels to recommend? Uh, what are the best channels you recommend to build networks with VCs that are based in the Valley and US in general? This is a great question. So I have many answers to this. One is you can do it completely online these days. Uh, just on Twitter, there are a lot of angel investors and emerging fund managers who are very active on Twitter, ourselves included, and who are also investing in Canadian entities. You can start to build relationships from Twitter. I've seen many familiar faces in the chat, actually, people I've never met in person, but have met on Twitter, quote, met on Twitter. So that's probably one place I would start. And you can start engaging that way and move some Twitter conversations to a phone call. Secondly, I think for Canadian companies in, in particular, um, there are now a number of groups and resources uh, that have strong ties to the Bay Area. So actually, you know, even though SVB is known as a bank, uh, and, and, and not to give Lathe more work, a lot of people in Toronto have actually been pinging Lathe, and he's been doing intros like crazy. I've gotten intros from him to Canadian founders. I'm sure he's introducing founders to other people. Um, you know, there, there's the whole C100 program, like they're, they're just all these different programs that have ties to the Valley. Uh, and so you can kind of look to see uh, where there may be possibilities there. There are also a lot of Canadian entrepreneurs now who went through YC or whatever, who are also doing those introductions. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, next question is from Vic. Uh, question, when should we pitch? I'm trying to get as much traction as we can and stretching the time before pitching to investors, but what would be the preferred perfect time to reach out to Hustle Fund and other investors? Mm. <laughs> this is a great question. It's going to vary by investor. So for Hustle Fund in particular, we call ourselves, quote, pre-seed investors. So our sweet spot is, um, you know, it's beyond an idea. Like you have built some early version of a product. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you've done something and or you've put together a wait list of customers or maybe even have some pre-sales. We do not care about traction. And so as such, you know, I think anything in that stage is our sweet spot. That being said, it's going to vary a lot by investor. I would say that if an investor calls themselves a pre-seed investor here in the U.S., they are generally at the same stage as us. Shout outs to others include Precursor, uh, Unshackled, um, rare breed, the fund, 2048, et cetera. Those are all what I would consider to be also pre-seed investors where we play. Um, but if somebody says they're a seed investor, that's going to require probably a bit of traction, like some revenue. All right. Um, next question is from Chris. When pitching without a deck, did you find it harder for people to understand your thesis because you aren't showing any corresponding data? So this is where you need to really know your story well. It's important to understand what are all the questions you're going to be asked about some of the five key points that Eric made, you know, things around the problem. What is the particular problem you're trying to solve, the solution about your team, et cetera. You need to know all of those components down pat so that way you can on the fly take, you know, these modules of answers, if you will, in any direction. Um, so I think the answer concisely is actually by making it a conversation, it does make it more natural and easier for you to hone in on particular parts that are of concern to an investor. Like some investors care a lot about product, but others may not care at all. And you can just kind of skim past that. And so that would be my advice to everyone, just like practice your answers to the most common questions in those areas. Okay. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, next question from Warren. What happens if multiple term sheets don't come in at, at once? How long can you hold off on providing an answer to your first term sheet? Good question. So this is why we highly recommend cramming in meetings such that you can use those meetings to leverage yourself. So what do I mean by that? You, you do all these meetings as Eric outlined. And then let's say that one investor bites and they say, hey, we want to invest. Doesn't matter how big the investor is doesn't matter what the terms are. It's just, hey, we want to invest and these are the terms we're proposing. Use that to kind of leverage your situation with everybody else. Then you write to everybody and you say, hey, 
I just wanted to give you a quick update that actually we received terms from an investor. Don't say who it is, don't say what the terms are, et cetera. But it is the fact, the mere fact that you receive terms that will make everybody else move faster because everybody else will then have to decide, oh my gosh, this deal is moving quickly. Do I want to prioritize it and make a decision or do I actually not want to and want to kind of bow out here? And that is what you really want to get to. You want to get to those yeses and nos. So let's say that you tell everyone you have terms that will, uh, that will actually put a forcing function on everyone else to say, hey, actually we want in, um, this is what we propose. And that's how you get the auction going as Eric mentioned. So hopefully that helps. And that is why you do all your meetings together in order to kind of get answers from everyone. And you can use the fact that you have another term sheet or, or even verbal terms to push everyone along on the timeline you want. Yep, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, this question is from John. He says, Elizabeth, you recently posted on Twitter that $1,000 checks from angels are very valuable. As an angel investor, the minimum investment that I've seen thus far is $25,000. How do I find the VC funds that will accept $1,000 investments? The VC funds? So um, I think there's a difference between investing in startups directly and uh, investing in VC funds. And here's why. At least here in the US, and I believe this is true in Canada as well, there's a limited number of investor slots. Um, actually, whether it's in startups or VC funds. And so if you're looking at a VC fund that is trying to raise $50 million and they only have 99 slots, it means that every investor on average has to be investing half a million. And, and that's you know obviously a tall order. So anytime an, an investor is putting in 25K, it means that somebody else has to make that average half a million. And so that becomes a very challenging problem. And we at Hustle Fund certainly have faced that ourselves. And that's, that's unfortunately why we have not been able to take small checks. That being said, investing directly into startups is a lot easier and a lot easier to have these smaller minimums because even though there, there is actually a limit to the number of slots, very rarely do uh, startups fill all those slots because they are not raising 50 million typically in, in the seed stage. And so uh, you can invest $1,000 very often into small startups, even if they have a minimum. There have been many times where I've just asked, you know, hey, uh, where unfortunately I can only write a, you know, whatever thousand dollar check, $5,000 check or $25,000 check. And I know that you have a minimum, but you know, I think that we can be really helpful in other ways beyond money, including introductions. And, and then you're basically selling your way in, but it is definitely possible. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Anana's attendee asked, can you tell everyone you have term sheets to create FOMO when you don't really have one? I would not do that. <laughs> And the reason is, well, number one, your reputation and trust is everything in this game. And this is a long-term game. So if people feel like, oh, this is a liar right now, like you, it will be very challenging to go back to these people or be even in the ecosystem because everyone talks uh, for the long haul. So I, I would definitely not do that. Um, and so if anybody ever discovers that, then that's going to actually have huge consequences. Okay, <clears throat> thanks Elizabeth. So Caitlin asks, we have a strategic partnership with the sixth largest private employer in the world and through them six, access to 60 plus campuses and 1.2 million students. I want to make sure uh, VCs know this from the top. Would it be too much to put this on the first slide, which is their team slide, uh, she says, I know it should go last, but I really want to hook them. And also any recommendations to pos position this for maximum impact? There is no right or wrong way to do a slide deck. Um, the slides that Eric mentioned are the key things that you'll want to address. But, you know, I think in this industry, because attention spans are really short, if you have something you want to convey, I would convey it closer to the front. So it could be the first slide, but it could be after the team slide, whatever it is, it does not have to go last. Uh, so I just wanna make that very clear. So I, that sounds amazing. I would come out punching with it pretty soon, whether it's the top slide or the second slide, I don't know, but something uh, up front makes a lot of sense to me. Okay. Uh, John asked, do you drop to VCs that you're on a two week timeline to pitch and raise? Uh, sorry, repeat that question, please. Sure. Uh, John King asked, should, should I drop to VCs uh, when pitching that I'm on a two-week timeline to pitch and raise? 
Oh, to mention to VCs yeah. that you're, you're, I would not mention that because if you need to go beyond the two weeks, then you're shooting yourself in the foot. So I think the main takeaway here around this two week schedule is the idea of creating a forcing function for VC. So, you know, the reason for doing this, this crazy two week schedule is to pack meetings in and then use any terms that you get to leverage that with everyone else to make everyone else move faster. That is the the goal of the two weeks. It is not to complete your raise in two weeks per se. Okay, um, <clears throat> another question from anonymous attendee. When putting together an investor list, uh, can you share more insights on how to put that together if you are on the outside looking in? For example, how do you know which investors to reach out to? So I would start with a very large list. And so then the follow-up question is, where do you come up with that list? Um, Eric mentioned in the deck, you know, there's NFX, which has a long list. It's basically a pseudo social network of investors. And all these investors have listed, including ourselves, have listed things they're interested in. So you can figure out which ones are relevant to you. There's Crunchbase, there's Angel List. There are a lot of resources these days to help you put together your list. It will take you time to research all of these different angels and funds. And so I would actually spend a fair bit of time on that research. And then after that, this is where I think your point about not being in network comes in. Then I would try to get a warm referral. And again, you can these days actually find many of these people, especially newer investors on Twitter. And many of them actually don't require a warm referral like we don't. 15% of our investments are completely cold without any referral just from our website alone. Um, and plenty of others, like the ones I mentioned, Precursor, Rare Breed, 2048. You do not need a warm referral for any of these folks, the fund. You can even just cold email them. And, and so those folks, you may not need a warm referral. For the ones who do, this is where actually I think some of the success of uh, you know past Canadian founders helps. A lot of Canadian founders at this point have raised money from US investors. So find out like who are the portfolio companies of some of these other investors? And can you get introductions to those founders who can introduce you? So that's a little bit roundabout, but that is a good way actually to get a warm referral if you don't have a strong network. Chances are, if you are a founder, you know other founders. And some of those people have raised money from the people you want to raise money from. I can add to that a little bit. So uh, I'll tell a very quick story. You know, when we were raising Hustle Fund 1, our first fund is $11.5 million. Uh, it took us about nine months. And the first two, $3 million actually was really fast. We were like, who are the richest people that we know that we can talk to? <laughs> and then just ask them for money, right? And I was like, woohoo, you know, like in the next first like 30, 45 days, it was like, we could, we cobbled together pretty quick. And then after that, we ran out of leads. So mistake that we made was we would have our blurb all like exactly in the same way that we had just described it to you. And we'd say like, hey, uh, investor hung into Hustle Fund. Can you just send this to anyone that you think would be a good fit for Hustle Fund? And the response to that was usually, you never heard anything back about that, that email ever again, because you know, you're making hung work. You're making your investor work. It's like, oh crap, like, you know, how many should this be? There's just so many people I know. I'm so busy. I'll get to this on Saturday. And it's like, I'm, I don't want to do this. You never hear from them. Then we changed the question to, hey, hung. Here's our blurb. Can you send this to just one person? Just one person who you think would be a great fit for Hustle Fund. And usually the response after that was very high because you're it's perceived that you're not really making that person do much work. It's just like, well, yeah, I know one guy or one girl. And then um, usually it was the richest person that they knew. <laughs> so like, you know, we didn't have any connections into like family offices or institutions or anything like that when we started this game, but we quickly got into it because it turns out that you're, we're all like two or three degrees away from Bill Gates, essentially. Maybe that's maybe I'll use a different reference in the future than Bill Gates, <laughs> but like you know, someone who's of equivalent like billionaire wealth status, you know, and uh, you know, moral compass, hopefully. So it's it's a it, it's a pretty amazing small change to the question that can yield a lot more leads, and as a result, like you know, just like three and a half years in, we have like hundreds and hundreds of leads uh, that we're still processing through for our future funds and. I think this can be directly applied as a lesson to, to founders too. All right, thanks, Eric. <clears throat> okay, so next question comes from George. Is there a consensus that Canadian startups raising capital from US VCs have to be US incorporated? incorporated? Uh, will being a Canadian corporation impact fundraising from US VCs? 
So the answer is yes and no. I, I kind of briefly touched on this. Um, you know, I think staying as a Canadian uh, incorporated company comes with so many benefits, all, all the grants that you get uh, that you wouldn't get as a U.S. entity. And as such, actually, many U.S. investors really do appreciate that because their money goes a lot further. Number one, the exchange rate often works in U.S. investors' favor. Number two, valuations as well. And number three, the, the most critical point is this, that, you know, you can essentially pay for talent at a fraction of the price because of all of the grants. And so there are a lot of U.S. investors who appreciate this now, and there are a lot of U.S. investors investing in Canada these days. So I, I would say that it's a matter more of finding the right investor. You will run into investors who still are only investing in U.S. entities, and that's fine. You can't really convince them that's kind of their structure. But figure that out quickly, and then you know you can go from there. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, James asks, as a pre-seed investor, what kind of return do you expect out of your investment? For us at Hustle Fund, we are looking for at least 100x in our winners. Now, obviously, we cannot predict who is going to be a, a big winner like that, but that's what we're looking at. Like, if everything were to go well, do we think that from entry point of valuation to exit, there could be a 100x multiple or higher? And, and so that's our hope. Obviously, you know, if, if I could do that all day, then, well, we wouldn't even be talking in this webinar. Um, and, but that is kind of actually how a lot of investors here in the States think about things. I want to uh, add something to that, Elizabeth, which is there's a big difference between what is a win for a VC fund versus what is a win for an angel. So totally. if I'm an angel investor and I do some angel investing, like uh, I'm investing in Elizabeth's company, you know, if she doubles or triples my money, in a few years, that's freaking great. It's just like, cool, like 25,000 turned to $75,000. That's a pretty big win for me in a relatively short period of time. The problem though, is when you have external investors, limited partners, LPs in a VC fund, where the mathematics of power laws and returns becomes really complicated. And I think I didn't really understand this when I heard things like, you know, as a founder, like you got to swing for the fences and like go for like billion dollar outcomes. As a largely bootstrap founder in my career, I was like, why do I care about that? Like if I'm generating like $20 million in revenue and like super profitable, isn't that like an excellent business? The answer is it is an excellent business, but in the parlances of what returns are necessary for a viable VC fund, we have to be backing teams that are going for very venture backed, very, very large outcomes or for the math to flow through. Uh, to our investors to triple their money, quintuple their money, 10x their money is much, much harder. Therefore, you know, I usually have the advice that in the early days, especially the seed days, it's better to stack maybe more of your attention to angels because they are absent this conflict of interest of having shareholders or LPs like VC funds. VC funds have their place in time, but it's usually when you're in like a, a phase where like, okay, like we, we kind of figure some things out and we're going after like really, really rapid growth uh, in the future. Um, this is going to be a little bit too much of a plug of hustle fund, but like, we don't think that we apply that kind of pressure to, to founders in the early part of the journey. Like we like to deploy very quickly. We're not trying to pressure them into the next fundraise or anything like that. Cause we never liked that ourselves, but, uh, buyer beware, right. Of, of like this conflict of interest potentially between what VC expectations are and what most likely your angels are expecting. And so as a result, uh, you know, this is why actually I've pitch my optometrist a lot on Hustle Fund, where it may be helpful to you to make sure you have a good, healthy mix of angels, even though sometimes they are harder to find, add those folks to the list because it may actually be easier to get their money uh, given that they are not you know, looking for 100X or whatnot. And again, angels come in all forms and sizes, your dentist, your lawyer, your optometrist, your physician, your whatever. Um, at the party you go to, the five engineers you met. That's right. Hong, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions before we can get to our wrap up here. Sure. Uh, this question comes from Paul. Are weak intros worse than no intros? Would you recommend just code emailing if the strength of introduction is questionable? My recommendation is to try to do both. Uh, cold emailing is faster, right? You can send the email today. You're not waiting on somebody. Um, but a lot of people like warm referrals. So I would try to do both in parallel. It doesn't hurt you. It doesn't look bad. And so that's my recommendation there. Yeah. Even like folks like Mark Cuban are surprisingly good at email if you want to try to cold, do cold. So 
I would I would just go for it. Okay. Uh, one last question here from Nathus. How do you think Canadian founders should talk about their TAM in a U.S. market with VCs if they're still validating their expansion to the U.S.? This is a great question. So U.S. investors are going to discount everything you did in Canada if you are talking about the U.S. market. So what do I mean by that? Like, let's say that you're a business that has some local aspects and you've been serving the Toronto market. And let's say that you've done incredibly well and even have gotten up to, I don't know, 10 or $20,000 per month in revenue. If you go to a U.S. investor and you say, hey, I'm going to now expand to Atlanta, um, they will not give you credit for having gotten traction in the Toronto market because they will think, well, the Atlanta market is very different and all these other things. You haven't proven out anything. So they will treat you as if you haven't really done anything. So for those of you who have a business that is local specific, so different from B2B SaaS, but a local specific business, and you, you have proven out some pieces in Canada and you want to come to the US, I would highly recommend that you try to prove out some pieces in the US before you go to US investors and say, hey, this is a great US play. There's just so much skepticism from US investors around something that is completely unproven in the US. All right. Uh, I actually, Hong, if there's one more question, I think we, we were able to get through that pretty quickly. Maybe okay. we can... uh, one, one more. more. Yeah. Uh, Syed asks, do pre-seed VC funds have any issues with safes as the investment instrument? I keep hearing mixed opinions from investors on safes. Yes. So that is going to be pretty geography driven in the U.S. and especially in Silicon Valley. Uh, safes are very common these days. Everybody is doing safes. We pretty much do almost, I don't want to say quite 100% safes, but something on that order of like 90% plus are, are safes. It's just easy, no legal fees. That being said, I think if you are raising from cities, even in the US, like if you go to the Midwest or even New York, safes are less common. And sometimes investors will insist on doing an equity round or a convertible note. And so I, it will be geography dependent, but I am seeing safes more and more even in uh, Toronto, like there is a Canadian version of the safe on the YC website now. And so it is becoming more common. And I would actually try to pitch people who, who do a lot of investing on safes to make things easier for yourself if you can. All right, I think with that, uh, we're gonna wrap up today's session. So we took you on quite a journey on how to prepare for your fundraising process as Canadians looking for international investors or even those domestically. We uh, cover the assets, the process, as well as some of the mechanics of what this could look like. So uh, before we conclude, I just wanted to share another huge shout out to Silicon Valley Bank Canada. Check out svb.com slash Canada. A lot of our Canadian founders are enormously happy with this uh, very founder-friendly bank. Thank you so much for your support. And a huge thank you to y'all too. Um, you know, it's still not a very easy time uh, to be living in North America. And, you know, we're all at different stages of coping post-pandemic. But there is a lot of activity that's forming uh, right now this summer on the investor end. Um, and hopefully some of this advice can put you in the right path for successfully concluding your fundraise. And it's going to be, I think, a pretty awesome year building ahead uh, as founders. So congratulations to you all for sticking through it. Thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you again, Silicon Valley Bank Canada, and hope to see you all in a future session. All the best to you all. Thank you all.